Peter Bergman himself didn't even exist. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, give us a little like and a subscribe. We'll be putting out videos every Friday at 3 p.m. And if you're a true crime junkie like myself, you can like them. This case is really perplexing, to say the least. There are a lot of theories that will really like get your mind going. And I'm sure there's gonna be more than what I say. So if you have anything else to add, put them in the comments because I definitely wanna see what your thoughts are on this one. Let's get into today's case. So this is the case of Peter Bergman, kind of. <laughs> I'll explain what I mean. In 2009, a man calling himself Peter Bergman checked into a Sligo City hotel. And five days later, his body was found washed up on the beach. And to this day, his real identity isn't known. So I'm gonna start from the start of where we first place him. So there is CCTV footage of this man getting onto a bus in Derry bus station, which is up in Northern Ireland. He gets on a bus and he asks the driver, you know, is this bus going to Sligo? And the driver says, no, it's going to Galway. But he points him in the right direction. Guy gets on the Sligo bus and goes to Sligo. But like, it's clear that Sligo was the specific destination he had in mind. He had like a German slash Austrian slash Dutch kind of accent. Uh, accent. Nobody thought he was Irish at all, but the real question was how he actually got into the country. He had no identification on him. Obviously, if he flew into Ireland, there would have been a record. When you're going through an airport, everything is so regulated. But maybe he did that with his real documents and then disposed of them somewhere. Or maybe he got into Northern Ireland by ferry because it wasn't that regulated. They didn't really do tr checks on identification or anything like that. You could essentially just walk onto the ferry and then walk into Ireland. And then from Northern Ireland, you could get a bus to Ireland. So this man was dressed in black, wearing a black leather jacket, and he had two black bags, one over his shoulder and one in his hand. And he had no advance booking to stay anywhere, so a taxi driver just dropped him off in Sligo and he went and checked into Sligo City Hotel at 6.52 p.m. that day. It was 65 euro a night and he paid for three nights in advance, all in cash. And, and he actually wasn't asked to provide any ID or credit card or passport or anything like that. By law, it's actually something that the hotels are supposed to do, but unfortunately, they don't all follow that procedure. I don't know what would have happened if he was asked to provide these details, but he wasn't, so we don't have those answers. Now, when he signed the register, he signed his name, Peter Bergman, and he spelled it with two N's. When they looked into this, Bergman is a very common name in that German-Austrian kind of area, but they don't all spell it with two N's. In Austria, they do. They ran a search of passports of people with that name, and there were no matches for anybody with that name and description or within that age bracket, so it wasn't his name. And he also gave an address that, creepily enough, didn't exist. I'm gonna put it on the screen because there is no hope in hell <laughs> I'll be able to say it. But if you notice the Wien, that is actually the German for Vienna in Austria, but the street name doesn't exist and that postcode doesn't even correlate with Vienna postcodes. They only run from 1000 to 1901. So the postcode that he did provide, 4472, actually correlates with an area in Upper Austria, but he definitely knew that this wasn't a real address. So they do think that he had some kind of knowledge of the area and knowing that it was a fake address and like they weren't gonna find it. But in a sense, Peter Bergman himself didn't even exist. So moving on to the couple of days that he was staying in this hotel, he actually left and came back 13 times during the course of his stay. And every single time he left, he was holding a purple plastic bag, which was full every time. But every time he came back, he wasn't holding it at all. So they think that he was getting rid of belongings and he probably had it folded up in his pocket. And the police did really well with their search. 
They searched all of the bins in the Sligo area and they even searched the local dump. They were just looking for something to potentially identify this man. He was getting rid of them so that he couldn't be identified. But unfortunately, they didn't find anything. And while he was staying there, there was a member of staff that I think was just going into his room to clean it. She knocked on the door, but she got no response. So she presumed he was out and she went in. And when she got in, he was standing there in the middle of the room and he just froze. Like she had caught him off guard or something or caught him doing something that he wasn't meant to do. But then she also said that he seemed relieved when he realized it was just a member of staff. Was he hiding from someone? Is is he running from someone or something? Why was he so serious about not being found? Now there was a instance where he actually went to the post office in Sligo City and he bought eight 82 cent stamps and some airmail stamps. But unfortunately they couldn't establish who they were sent to, where they were sent to, or even when they were sent. So uh, it's, it's frustrating because we can't find anybody who has anything to do with this man, but he did clearly have correspondence somewhere. Somebody knew him. It's eerie because it's not like he wasn't known by anybody. So I'm gonna get into the days leading up to his death. There was a taxi driver that actually drove him up to Ross's point. He told this taxi driver that he was from Austria. I'm just gonna do a little skip forward to the day he checked out of the hotel. So he had stayed there for three nights and on the 15th of June, 2009, he actually asked for a late checkout. So at about 1 p.m. he checked out of the hotel and made his way to the bus station where he was planning on getting the 240 bus to Ross's Point. He left the hotel with three bags. He had the two black bags that I mentioned before and he also had the purple bag. This was caught on CCTV. He wasn't on CCTV the whole way to the bus station. It was about a 15 minute walk, but when he got there, he only had two bags. He just had the purple bag and one of the black bags. So somewhere along the way, he got rid of more belongings. When he got to the bus station, he had a cappuccino and a toasted sandwich, which I, I don't know why, but that detail made me feel really connected to the case because we literally know exactly what he had before he went to the place that he would eventually die. It's just such a simple thing, but like that really made it seem more real to me. I don't know. While he was at this cafe, he wrote some stuff down on a piece of paper and he, he just looked at it for a while and eventually he tore it up and left it on the table. So like I said, he was planning on getting the 240 bus to Ross's Point, which is about a 20 minute journey. It was about 2 p.m. when he was there and he was looking for help to make sure that he got the bus on time. Vincent Dunbar was the name of the depot inspector, so he asked him for help. Vincent basically said that he just seemed really uptight and stressed about getting the bus. I mean, I totally understand this. In a new country that maybe you haven't spent a lot of time in and you're getting a bus, like it can be quite stressful because you don't really know the layout or the system or anything. So totally get that. But he also said that he seemed to be a really unusual worrying color, that he looked kind of weathered. But anyway, he arrived at Ross's point at about 3 p.m. with his one black bag and his purple bag. And there were multiple sightings of him at Ross's Point Beach that day. There was one at 4 p.m., one at 5 p.m., several between 9 and 11 p.m. And then the last ever sighting of him alive was at 11.50 p.m. Two of these witnesses were a couple that came forward to actually tell their story of what they saw that day. It was as the sun was setting and they said he was framed against the sun setting, which made him like a golden silhouette. Oh, there's a light on my face. I might have to wait for it to go away. <coughs> anyway, they said that his movement was very strange and it was almost like he was deliberately stepping from left to right. And they actually said it was kind of almost like a ritual of some sort. They actually kind of nicknamed him the golden man. That just shows how good the weather was that day. It was, you know, sunny, relatively calm, and it was like 17 degrees, which for Ireland 
is unfortunately pretty good. <laughs> And there was one high tide around noon on that day on the 15th, which is also the day he checked out of the hotel and all that kind of stuff. And the next high tide was about 25 minutes after midnight, so into the 16th of June. But after 11.50 p.m., nobody else saw him until the following morning, sometime around 6.30, 6.45 a.m., when Arthur Kinsella and his son saw what they thought was like a, a mannequin on, washed up on the beach. But it was unfortunately this man who was kind of Peter Bergman. Naturally, the only cause of death that makes sense here is drowning. So that's what the police thought. That's what Arthur Kinsella and his son thought. The policeman that was on duty that day found the scene kind of unusual because he was wearing a t-shirt and he was wearing swimming togs but with his underwear over them. It's just so weird. Anyway, the rest of his clothes were actually found in a neat little pile on a rock nearby. What was also quite strange was all of the labels had been cut off. They kind of theorized maybe this was because he didn't want anybody to track down anything about him so you know if you have a brand name you might find out where he's from and, and that was kind of what they thought it was uh but it might not be that deep like maybe he actually just doesn't like labels on clothes like i have definitely cut off some labels in my time <laughs> but yeah like maybe it was just another way for him to hide his identity obviously he had no wallet or id or credit cards or anything at all but in his pockets were a black watch, tissues, a small bar of soap from another country, weird thing to carry around with you, uh, just under 150 euro in cash, and also some aspirin. Like the police did such good work on this case, they tried to track down everything, the batch number on the aspirin, they looked into that too, and couldn't find anything. <laughs> there were so many leads, but no answers. His glasses were also missing, and now he was seen in so many CCTV clips wearing these glasses, and they were no, nowhere to be found either. And for a while, the police waited for someone to come forward and claim him, but nobody did. The police looked into the missing persons bureaus of all of the countries that he could potentially have been from, and there were no matches. And they also sent out all the information they had on this man to the other police forces in those countries so that they could you know disperse that further but again nobody came forward in any of these countries it was almost like he didn't even exist before being seen at that bus station in Derry. a lot of people think that he just came to sligo to die which is kind of haunting because at ross's point there was a specific point at the end of the beach called Dead Man's Point. So I wanna get into the autopsy. So this is where things get a little bit weird. So their findings were, obviously there was sand in his ears and there was also some wasting of the muscles in his hands, which clinically actually suggests recent weight loss. And the really weird thing, there was no sign of salt water drowning, which leads you to wonder like, what happened to this unidentified man? Who is he and what happened to him? Another thing from the autopsy, there actually was evidence of a previous heart attack. So maybe he could have had another one while he was there, but the timing of his death was just, everything was so meticulously planned. You know, all the times getting rid of all this stuff and just as he checked out of the hotel and he spent that whole day at Ross's Point Beach, it, it just doesn't make sense because you can't, plan to die of a heart attack but then another finding came about and that was that he had cancer cells in his prostate the cancer was very advanced and had led to his bones his lungs and his chest and according to the experts his life expectancy at that point would have been maximum weeks but obviously this would explain the recent weight loss as well they said that there was no way he could have possibly known that he wasn't really, really ill and he more than likely knew that he was dying. But why get rid of your identity? This man was someone's son. He was potentially someone's brother, father, husband, best friend, colleague. 
are there people out there that loved him and that are still missing him that don't have any answers? Okay, so I'm gonna get into the theories now. So the first theory was that Peter Bergman was on a literary pilgrimage. So W.B. Yeats was a poet and a writer who was a very important part of Sligo's history. And a lot of his poems were based in Sligo. Yeats wrote one novel and there are very strange similarities between the man in this novel and Peter Bergman. The man's name was John Sherman. Sherman sounding somewhat similar to Bergman. And John Sherman had a yearning for Sligo and wanted to go and die without anybody knowing who he was. John Sherman also stayed in a hotel alone the few days leading up to his death. Both men were smokers and both men on the day that they died went out for some fresh air by a large body of water. John, the river, and Peter, the ocean. Like really there's no evidence for this theory, but it is a really strange one in the fact that there's so many similarities there. And just, yeah, just those little similarities. It's, it's quite a strange one. The second theory was actually put forward by Ireland Today this year in 2020 in January. And that is that Bergman is the name that was used by the son of Martin Bormann, who was a high-ranking Nazi leader. It is an interesting one given Peter's very strong German slash Austrian accent. Naturally, if you had a father who was a high-ranking Nazi leader, you probably don't wanna have anything to do with them. And also, after the war, there was a man found wandering the mountains just south of Salzburg in Austria, and he fell ill. He actually was helped out by a local farmer, and he gave the name Bergman and also gave a fake address. So quite coincidental that two people, many, many years apart, were both using the same fake name and a fake address and both had German slash Austrian ties. That brings me on to the next theory, which is Peter Bergman was an escaped witness protection member. This would explain why he would want to keep his identity safe. As far as I'm aware, witness protection programs aren't something you like escape or anything, but if you do decide to leave, you're, you're out on your own and, and your safety and security is totally up to you. And obviously if he knew he had late stage cancer, it could have been a motive also for him to want to get out and about one last time and you know be by the ocean maybe he had specific ties to sligo or ireland and also then someone who is that sick their body could easily just give out if they exert themselves too much which could easily just be by a walk or swimming and the last theory is that he was just a terminally ill man who wanted to go and die alone. Maybe he had a really tough life and he was the only one who could be there for himself. And maybe he just had decided to give up. Because we often hear stories about terminally ill people who once they give up mentally, their body doesn't take that long to follow suit. If you guys have any other theories though, put them down below because I am, my mind is boggled by this case. There are probably people who knew this man still wondering where is the man that we know as Peter Bergman? But listen, that is the end of that case. Thank you so much for watching. Give a like if you want more true crime videos and subscribe and hit the little bell because I will be uploading every Friday at 3 p.m. I've got other true crime videos that you might be interested in, so I'll leave them in little boxes. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.